call him Ken Rockburn. In late 1968 and early 1969, the province of Ontario created the Regional Municipality of Ottawa Carleton. Made up of 11 municipalities, including the city of Ottawa, the new region's first job was to create a plan for future growth for the area in which we live. Tonight, we're going to take a look at that plan, a plan that was completed four and a half years later in the fall of 1974. It's a plan that many residents of the region feel could have a devastating effect on a lot of the communities in which we live. We'll be talking to politicians and planners and citizens groups, and we'll take a look at three of the more contentious issues of the official regional plan for Ottawa Carleton. We'll be back with that in just a moment. And now they're giving us a plan Everybody knows it Nobody understands That it's one step forward One step forward One step forward and Two steps back On October 9th, 1974 Regional Council voted to adopt this document, the official plan, Ottawa Carleton Planning Area, otherwise known as the Regional Plan. Now, it's an impressive looking piece of literature, full of maps and diagrams, and lofty sounding phrases and noble ideals, and quite obviously, a vast amount of work went into its conception. Between the covers of this document lies a plan for better homes at better prices, better interurban transit quicker routes to places of employment, a well-maintained environment, nicer neighborhoods, lots of park space, the list goes on and on. To give you a better idea of the aims and objectives of the regional plan, I'll read to you the first sentence, which says, and I quote, the policies of this plan are directed to creating an environment within which the physical, social, and mental well-being of all persons who live in the planning area can be advanced. Now that sounds good, but it can mean a variety of things. And in fact, many residents of the region feel that what the regional plan says it's going to do and what it's going ahead and doing are two completely different things. In the next 60 minutes, we'll try to take a look at some of the contradictions that have cropped up in the regional plan. And I suppose as good a place to start as any would be with the aspect of growth, since that's what planning is all about to begin with, growth. Now the basic assumption of the regional plan is that the population of the ottawa Carleton region will reach one million people by the year 1998. Now, this figure will only be reached if certain factors remain constant. For instance, birth rate or employment opportunities must stay at the same rate that they have in the recent past in order for us to reach that figure of one million people. Now, that figure of one million has caused a lot of debate, but nonetheless, it is the figure that Regional Council has decided upon, and it is the figure upon which all of the growth patterns in this plan have been based. Now, with that figure of one million people in mind, the next question, obviously, is where are we going to put them all? Well, to answer that question, regional planning staff conducted a series of studies, and they came up with six designated areas for potential satellite cities outside of the Greenbelt. The six areas designated were Kanata Glen Cairn in the west, an already existing community, Barhaven in the southwest, which now has a population of around 2,000 people, South Nepean and South Gloucester on either side of the Rideau River, combined under the name of the South Growth Area, Carlsbad Springs in the rural southeastern part of the region, and finally, the small community of Orleans in the extreme east. Now, a storm of controversy has raged around the two areas that we're going to be looking at tonight. That's Carlsbad Springs and the south growth area of Gloucester and Nepean Townships. This is the area around Carlsbad Springs. It comes highly recommended as a location for a satellite city. In fact, Carlsbad Springs is supported by the federal government through the National Capital Commission, it's supported by the city of Ottawa. Almost every community association in the region supports it. And in the beginning, the regional planning staff supported the area as the major site for a new southeastern community of 100,000 people. In Appendix A of the regional plan, there's a chart that lists 16 criteria for establishing the best site location for a new satellite city. The six urban locations outside of the Greenbelt in the regional plan were stacked up against one another and only two of them received an A rating, the highest rating given. Those two were Kanata Glen Cairn in the West End, and this area, Carlsbad Springs. 
Carlsbad Springs has a number of things going for it that make it a choice area to develop, not the least of which is the fact that the majority of land in the area is not of the highest quality. As you can see from this illustration, there is no class one soil, which would be indicated by a solid red area. There's only class two soil, indicated by the dotted area, and classes four, five, six, and seven, which are represented by the white areas. This means that one of the main goals of the regional plan, the desire to infringe upon the least amount of usable agricultural land as possible, can more easily be realized in the Carlsbad Springs location. The land is also publicly owned, which makes it unique among the growth areas. And, unlike any of the other five areas, it scored an A rating for having little effect on the river corridor in terms of pollution. It also scored high for offering a minimum amount of disruption to existing communities in the area of transportation, since Highway 417 would provide the major means of travel to the city core. In fact, the only serious problem that's been raised against Carlsbad Springs as a development site lies down here under my feet. It seems that the subsurface conditions are full of something called Lita clay, and uh, housing foundations apparently don't rest too easily on Lita clay. But some experts have said that the entire region is sitting on Lita clay, and that the problem is not that serious. But in spite of all this evidence, Regional Council has decided to select the South Growth Area as a priority location, and leave Carlsbad Springs for something they call future development. Bob McQuarrie, the Reeve of Gloucester Township, the township which not only holds Carlsbad Springs but half of the South Growth Area, feels that regional planning staff didn't use the most recent information on Carlsbad Springs and that the planning in its entirety was, was done by junior planners in the regional planning department. To find out exactly how the planners did select the South Growth Area and the other five locations that they chose outside of the Green Belt in the regional plan, we spoke to Gary Goodman, the head of the Policy and Programs branch of the regional planning department. What factors are taken into consideration when a growth area is selected for a region like Ottawa Carleton? Well, we take quite a, a number of factors into consideration. We look at, uh, I guess, the first thing would be environmental factors, and they can be broken down into quite a number of uh, uh, factors uh, or aspects. Uh, we look at the amount of agricultural land that would be affected, uh, things like the uh, whether there are any important mineral aggregates, uh, if there are any sensitive areas that will be affected. Uh, we'd uh, also look at things like the uh, development implications. Uh, we'd take a look at uh, how, f how expensive it would be to develop the services uh, to service areas such as uh, water and sewer trunks, uh, the major transportation routes, both uh, public transit and the roads. And we look at uh, the cost that it might uh, uh, that might be incurred to develop in the area, such as uh, if there's a rock near the surface, it would be expensive to build the houses. Uh, if there were poor subsurface conditions, that might be uh, very expensive to overcome. And uh, we also look at whether there's been commitments made in the area, such as uh, registered uh, plans of subdivision or possibly draft approved, things like zoning commitments. Those are taken into consideration. Um, We'd also look at the ownership of the land to uh, see if it's public or private. Uh, uh, that, that's an important factor. How does that play a part? You know, how do you, you judge public ownership? Is it a priority over private ownership? Well, uh, I think so. Uh, it depends. If, uh, if uh, an area has a great deal of public ownership, it might not be important. On the other hand, if an area has uh, solid private ownership uh, and there is a piece of public land, uh, it makes sense to... Uh, uh, develop that and uh, provide an option. And how do you deal with uh, something like the Lita, Cla uh, Lita clay situation in the soil in the Ottawa Carleton region, which I understand is under most of the region? Did that not affect all the growth areas that were recommended by? Well, to varying degrees. Uh, Lita clay varies greatly. You can't uh, uh, judge the uh, developability of an area just by the knowledge of its Lita clay, or it's not. It's uh, something that has to be studied for each area, and there are a great many factors. Uh, but uh, certainly it underlies some of the growth areas, not all. Was the plan or the recommendations that were made by planning staff for the growth areas in Ottawa Carleton uh, done by senior planning staff? Yes. Yeah, in fact, uh, when you say senior, uh, uh, do, you, do you mean the... Uh, 
Well, there's been uh, talk by some members of regional council that one of the problems with uh, the selection of Carlsbad Springs, for instance, was that the planning that was done for that was done by junior staff and the information that was used was not the most recent. Oh, I see. Uh, it would depend on the definition of junior, but certainly uh, everybody was, uh, uh, exper they were experienced planners and uh, we had no junior staff, in fact. We only had senior planners uh, in the office for those uh, years. But then, of course, there's uh, the planning commissioner himself and uh, heads of branches at the time. They also were involved. Mm -hmm. um, the South Growth Area now has been selected as a priority uh, area for development. Um, does it differ very greatly from any of the other areas? Oh, yes. I, I think they're all very different one from the other. Uh, South certainly is different than unique in many ways. So it would appear that all available information was taken into consideration by regional planning staff in their selection of Carlsbad Springs. And according to Mr. Goodman, the department itself had only senior planners in its employ for the first five years of its existence. Well, in light of this, you may be wondering why Regional Council decided to ignore planning staff recommendations and select the South Growth Area as a priority development site. If Carlsbad Springs is good, you ask, then how good must the South Growth Area be? Well, to find out, we took a trip up the Rideau River to see for ourselves, and we'll be back with that in just a moment. forward, one step forward, two step back. This is the site of the South Growth Area. It's just south of the city, as the name implies, on the outer boundary of the Greenbelt, and lies on both sides of the Rideau River. The eastern side is in Gloucester Township, and the western side is in the Peon Township. Ever since Regional Council selected the South Growth Area as a priority development area over Carlsbad Springs, the objections have been flying fast and furious. The Regional Plan stipulates a population of the South Growth Area of 100,000 people, 35,000 on the eastern side in Gloucester Township, and 65,000 on the western side in Nepean Township. One criticism is that in order to keep the area as a community, bridges will have to be constructed over the Rideau River to join the two halves something that doesn't have to be done in Carlsbad Springs. Transportation poses another problem that would be more complex to solve than at the Carlsbad site. To accommodate residents in the area, either one of two alternatives are available. First, existing roads would have to be widened to facilitate increased traffic flow to the city core. If this method is not acceptable, then a new route would have to be constructed. Now, regional planners had originally decided that the best solution would be this last choice, a new arterial, known in the regional plan as the Merivale Corridor. Unfortunately, this, ro this new road would have a devastating effect on existing communities, and after closer examination, the Merivale Corridor was dropped from the plan. Now, we'll take a closer look at the Merivale Corridor and that entire situation a little later on in the program. Environmental factors play a large part in criticism of the South Growth Area as well. Many community groups in the region aren't satisfied with assurances that stormwater runoff won't add further to the pollution of both the Rideau and the Jock Rivers. Now, these rivers are much slower moving and much less able to absorb pollutants than the faster moving Ottawa River, which is the runoff point for the Carlsbad Springs site. The Provincial Ministry of the Environment is still working on that problem. But one of the most frequently argued objections to the South Growth Area is the development of first-class agricultural soil for housing. Critics say that using up this good land, which is indicated by the darker shades on, of the map on your screen, is a direct contravention of one of the prime objectives of the regional plan. That is, to encroach upon as little productive agricultural soil as possible. In fact, on page 5-2 of the regional plan, it says, and I quote, it is an objective of this plan that good quality farmland be conserved, both because it's a non-renewable productive resource and because its conservation is in the interest of those members of the community whose occupation is farming, unquote. Now it goes on to say that not all agricultural land can be preserved for its original purpose and that some of it may have to be developed, but it is an objective, an objective of the plan 
that as little of this agricultural soil as possible be used up. Living next door to the airport can create some interesting problems for a community. And in fact, uh, the federal government has just recently told the region that future plans for southern expansion of Uplands Airport may interfere with development in the South Growth Area. Now, supporters of the South Growth Area as a development site seem to feel that aircraft noise won't have any effect on the residents of that future community. But if you take a look at some of the figures in this book, a preliminary study on the South Growth Area, you'll find some interesting figures on aircraft noise. First of all, close to 8,000 acres of land in the area, which are indicated by the dark green border on the map, are owned by development companies, Compo and Jockvale Realties being the largest landholders. But only a little over 1,000 acres of this land will be developed by these companies privately. The remainder of the land, owned by the developers, which is indicated by the solid green area on the map, will be subsidized by the Ontario Housing Action Program, which allows the companies to build homes for low and moderate income families. Now, the federal government has indicated that a new runway may be built just south of the existing east-west runway at Uplands Airport. The airport, incidentally, is located just northeast of the South Growth area. Now, if this is done, the maximum noise cone for this new runway will look something like this. According to Ministry of Transport calculations, the noise levels inside of this noise cone are sufficient to provoke, and I quote, sporadic to repeated individual complaints and some group action is possible, unquote. Now, this reaction from the community is based on past experience from airports all over the world, as well as airports from inside of Canada. And you'll notice that the noise cone affects a good-sized portion of the low- and middle-income areas. Now, these are just some of the criticisms that have been leveled at the South Growth Area as a development site. And supporters of the area feel that all of these problems can be overcome in one form or another. Bob McCrory, Reeve of Gloucester Township, is one of the advocates of the South Growth Area, and we spoke to him to find out why. Mr. McCory, I was wondering if you could tell me what kind of a policy the Township of Gloucester has towards the idea of growth. Basically, the Township is not pro-growth. Uh, during the course of the regional plan, we had uh, pressed very strongly for communities of modest size, 35,000 ideally, a community large enough to support facilities like a small general hospital, two high schools, French and English, and uh, the elementary schools. Uh, communities very much as uh, you would find, I think, throughout uh, other sections of Ontario, communities that you'd like to live in. And uh, this was the type, basically, of community that we in Gloucester were aiming for. Now, as far as Gloucester and uh, growth is concerned, we have absorbed a lot of growth. We have adopted very rigid development policies. In fact, uh, our de development controls are among the most restrictive in the province, and uh, by virtue of the Township of Gloucester Act, we're one of the few municipalities who can uh, uh, obtain from developers uh, land in accordance with density, uh, in our case five acres per thousand. The developers incidentally uh, have uh, appealed this practice to the province. We're one of five municipalities in the province that do have uh, this five acres per thousand of public open uh, space policy, but uh, well, speaking Thus far, of, they haven't been successful. Yeah. Speaking of this kind of space, then, um, with plans to go ahead with the South Growth Area on the Gloucester side of, of the Rideau River, um, there will be some agriculture, there's been criticism, there will be some agricultural land that could be used productively, that will be used up by development. I was wondering how you saw this. Well, undoubtedly, there will be some land used that does have agricultural capability. Uh, similarly, I think in other sections of the township, there's land with agricultural capability. I'd be gilding the lily if I said that uh, in developing South Gloucester there would be no land with agricultural capability sacrificed. The fact is that at the present time and for some ten years it hasn't been used intensively for agriculture and uh, has, like a lot of the Greenbelt, simply uh, uh, grown up and uh, at best produces a hay crop. Mm -hmm. Now. 
this land in the, in the South Growth area in the Gloucester section is going to be close to the airport and there is a proposed new east-west runway that's been designated for the airport and we've taken a look previously in the program at the possible noise cone projection of this new runway and I was wondering if Gloucester had any intention of doing anything about the homes that might be covered by that noise cone area. Yeah, well, we were very much aware from the outset of the proposed expansion of the airport uh, even though they say it's uh, unlikely in view of Mirabelle. Uh, we've planned accordingly and we're, uh, I think it's quite safe to say it will be a policy of Gloucester that no residential development will be allowed beyond the uh, 30 uh, noise exposure factor contour line, which uh, as you know, residential development is of a limited type is permitted between contour lines 30 and 35, but we don't propose to encroach on that uh, area at all. In the uh, concept plans that we've evolved for the South community, that area is largely occupied by a ponding area for stormwater treatment, a very substantial uh, area for a golf course, and uh, industrial lands. Mm -hmm. Okay, now speaking of, of another fairly um, vocal group uh, criticism that has come out about the South Growth Area, we have the problem of, of uh, potential pollution of the Rideau River uh, with development taking place on both banks of the river. And I was wondering if you saw a solution to this problem. Well, uh, in, in uh, recent years, the polluting effect of storm water has been uh, runoff from urban areas has been recognized. Mind you, storm water from agricultural areas and from the rest also has a uh, pollutant effect, be it fertilizers or uh, animal excrement. But uh, an experiment is currently being carried out in the Barhaven area of uh, Nepean to determine the effectiveness of ponding and treatment. We in the Gloucester side are blessed by the fact that most of the drainage takes place through the Mosquito Creek and its valleys, and it also is an excellent uh, location for ponding and for treatment, be it by chlorination and skimming or uh, superoxidation or whatever the treatment process uh, uh, is. So that uh, from the point of view of pollution is something that certainly concerns us. We're anxious to preserve the, the Rideau River. We're taking steps to acquire frontage along the Rideau River. In fact, from the Green Belt South, I would say the township currently holds in excess of half a mile of uh, Rideau River frontage. Uh, our community, or the community that's proposed for uh, uh, south of the airport, is uh, located east of the river road and hopefully through time the uh, river frontage will all fall into uh, public ownership. We're not zoning it that way, we're acquiring land as and when it becomes available. So there we have what sounds like a pretty convincing argument that the South Growth Area is in actual fact a good location to put a satellite city. Well who do you believe in this question? Both sides have armed themselves with technical data and soil studies and so forth to convince us, the citizens, that they are in the right. And to the ordinary layman like myself, and I assume most of you, it's impossible to understand a lot of this technical information without a degree in engineering. But there are certain aspects of the South Growth Area Carlsbad Spring controversy that can be looked at and can be evaluated without the benefit of this kind of technical material. For instance, Carlsbad Springs, as we noted earlier in the program, is supported by the City of Ottawa. It's supported by the federal government through the National Capital Commission. It's supported by a lot of the community associations in the region. And in the beginning, it was supported by regional planning staff. The South Growth Area, on the other hand, is supported only by regional government, and even then, only by a five-vote margin. Now, needless to say, private developers would also like to see the South Growth Area go ahead first. And that brings us to the second area that we can take a look at without the benefit of this kind of technical information. Carlsbad Springs is publicly owned land. The South Growth Area is not. 
And this has led to a number of accusations to the effect that regional council and even the provincial ministry of housing are at the beck and call of the major housing developers. Now in early May of this year, at a meeting of the supply committee of the provincial ministry of housing, MLA New Democrat Mike Cassidy from the Ottawa area fired some pretty heavy accusations at provincial minister of housing John Rhodes. It's interesting to take a look at Mr. Rhodes' comments. Mr. Cassidy began by outlining most of the objections to the South Growth Area that we've taken a look at in the program so far tonight. He then stated that the controversy surrounding Carlsbad Springs and South Growth was far from being finalized and that in all likelihood the question would be referred to the Ontario Municipal Board for a final decision. He then accused the Ministry of Housing of trying to influence the OMB decision in advance and as evidence of this he cited the fact that Ontario Housing Action Program agreements have already been signed in the South Growth Area with a lot of the developers and that the Ministry of Housing has forwarded monies in excess of $55,000 for a preliminary study of the South Growth Area. Now why, Mr. Cassidy asked, was this being done when the decision to select the South Growth Area as a priority development was far from being finalized? And Mr. Cassidy's concern here was that this money that would be passed along in terms of housing to uh, residents, future residents of the area, would vastly raise the cost of housing in an area that was supposed to be for low and moderate income homes. Now, Mr. Rhodes denied trying to influence the OMB decision, of course, but in doing so, he provided us with a sort of interesting insight into his attitude towards the region of Ottawa Carleton and the concerns of its residents. According to Hansard, Mr. Rhodes said, I don't see how I'm prejudicing the OMB's decision because the whole area eventually is going to be developed to some degree and the planning is going to have to be done. In view of the fact that most of the residents of the Ottawa Carleton region, not to mention the city of Ottawa itself, are against population growth, having a provincial minister say that growth is unavoidable does nothing to quiet the fears that the province really has little regard for municipal governments. In fact, it would appear to confirm these fears more than anything else. The growth question is only one aspect of the regional plan. Other issues have been raised that pose equally heated and controversial debate. And we'll be back in just a moment to take a look at some of those problems. Planners want the southeast, growth priority. But council thought the south was the only place to be. Planner was defeated, in his heart is right. Everybody knows who benefits, but they look too big to fight. But it's one step forward, one step forward, one step forward and two steps back. Once you've built these satellite cities outside of the Green Belt, and you haven't provided enough in the way of jobs or entertainment to keep people close to home, you're faced with the problem of transporting them to the center of the city. Now, mention has been made in the regional plan of a rapid transit system that would, in theory at least, transport people quickly and efficiently with a minimum amount of disruption to the environment. But the plan also includes more than token tribute to that ever-present god, the automobile. Now, the length of this program restricts us from looking at all the transportation problems that appear in the regional plan, but we can look at a few. And since we've just finished looking at the South Growth Area, perhaps it would be appropriate to take a look at the major transportation implication of that area, that is, the Merivale Corridor. In 1974, the regional plan designated a strip of land running from Highway 416 in the south along Merivale Road below the Queensway and up Tweedsmuir Avenue to Scott Street as the probable route of a future transportation facility. Now, you would have been hard-pressed until just recently to find anyone who didn't believe that this new facility would not be a major new north-south arterial. As a result, the region has been buying up land along the Merivale Corridor for the past two years. But opposition to this acquisition of land has been led by Alderman Tripp Kennedy, who feels that the region shouldn't be spending millions of dollars on this kind of thing until studies are done to evaluate what kind of transportation system would be best and exactly uh, what would be required in the way of either light rail or an arterial. Now, he's been pressing for a study to be done to sort of solve these problems before that amount of money is spent. And the study was released by Regional Transportation Committee just this past June. 
The study indicated that a new arterial would not be needed and that a transit way would be sufficient to serve the area north of the inner ring road. But like all staff recommendations, the report based this conclusion on several conditions. It said that a major arterial would not be needed if a new link between the inner ring road and the proposed outer ring road were constructed, and if Woodruff Avenue and Prince of Wales Drive south of Baseline Road were widened from two lanes to four lanes. The study also stated that the Merivale arterial would not be needed as long as transit use during rush hours rose from the present 8% in the Black Rapids Creek area to 40% and continued to rise to 50% as you got closer to the city core. Finally, the report said that the arterial would not be necessary as long as the population of the south growth area on the Nepean side of the river would be no greater than 65,000 people and that 23,000 jobs would be created in the new community. Now, if all of these conditions are met, regional planners say that the present road system will be adequate for the next couple of decades. But again, they add some qualifications. They say that in the event of extreme traffic congestion, it might be necessary to widen Green Bank, Woodruff, Fisher, and Prince of Wales Drive to four lanes south of Carling Avenue. But at any rate, the upshot of this entire thing is that we still have the Merivale Corridor, but instead of having a major arterial with a right-of-way of as wide as 300 feet being put in it, we now have a transit way with a right-of-way of as little as 30 feet being put in it. Now, it seems easy, doesn't it? But unfortunately, not all of the transportation problems in the regional plan can be dealt with this simply. This is the community of Britannia Bay in the west end of Ottawa. It's a quiet residential area overlooking the Ottawa River. And directly across the river is the Quebec community of Duchesne. In the official plan, this area has had two proposals designated for it. First is the construction of a bridge from the Quebec side, which would pass near the filtration plant just east of the Britannia Yacht Club, and connect with the existing section of the Western Parkway, which heads south. The Western Parkway would then be extended further south to connect with the inner ring road, thus creating a gigantic circle around the entire city, ending at the proposed Kettle Island Bridge in the east. Regional planners hope that the people on the Deschain side will connect the Deschain crossing with Auto Route 50, and thus we would have a great circle circling both the cities of Ottawa and Hull, so you could drive around and around again and never have to stop unless you wanted food and gas. The second proposal for Britannia is an extension of the Ottawa River Parkway west to link up with Highway 417 near Acres Road. This would isolate about a third of Britannia Bay from the rest of the community, and would also slice through an existing wildlife preserve. Now this arterial, as residents of the area refer to it, and the Deschain Bridge were both scheduled to be implemented along with the rest of the regional plan. But priorities have been lowered on the Ottawa side due to a lowering of priority for the Deschain crossing by politicians on the Quebec side. Now you would think that this kind of thing would make the residents of Britannia Bay happy, but it doesn't. And to find out why, we talked to Mary Gregory of Action Britannia. What kind of effect is the Britannia arterial going to have on the community of Britannia Bay? The effect the Britannia Arterial is going to have on the, the residents here of Britannia is to cut them off from the rest of the city of Ottawa because it will follow the route of the existing NCC bike path which cuts along through the edge of the conservation that we, that, where we are right now. It will go through Britannia Village, which is a historic neighbourhood of the city of Ottawa. It will go through a 60-acre regional park and then finally um, along the western w waterfront, which is also a conservation area. Do you think that there's a need for this kind of thing? Is it really necessary to have that arterial? I think the problem here is a confusion in land use principles. They're, they're confusing two different types of things in as much that if you refer to the regional plan, it's, it's very obvious since uh, on the conservation and recreational maps, this is clearly designated as a conservation area, as is Britannia Park, as, a, as an important regional recreational resource. On the other hand, uh, it looks like the person that put together the map for transportation was not aware of the recreation programs and uh, therefore we have the Britannia Arterial going through here. I think that uh, if there is a need for more laneways of, uh, for traffic, they can be accommodated elsewhere. What kind of other groups do you have supporting you? Since this is a conservation area, it would seem that there might be other groups that would support an action like this. Yes, certainly. We have a number of groups uh, behind us in this issue since this is uh, the largest and the only 
conservation area in the city of Ottawa, consisting of 180 acres with many species, uh, some of them uh, not so well known and others that are uh, fairly well known, particularly birds. Uh, we have the Canadian Nature Federation, uh, which is a national organization. We have the Rideau Trail Association, since this is also part of the Rideau Trail, and uh, the National Provincial Parks Association, plus a number of other scores, and uh, the Ottawa Field Naturalist Club, of course, just to mention a few of them. Okay, what about the Duchesne Bridge, which is a separate question now. What kind of effect is it going to have on the community here? Well, the Duchesne Bridge, bridge is going to be a north-south problem, as opposed to the arterial, which is facilitate traffic going east-west to downtown Ottawa from the suburbs. Uh, the Duchenne crossing, as we say it, is a problem because first of all, the, there has never really been any adequate studies to, su to suggest that we really do need a crossing at this area. And secondly, um, there has been no rights of way preserved for any kind of access to such a bridge. Um, if a bridge does have to go in, it can be accommodated so as not to destroy any kind of uh, conservation area here, any of the neighborhoods, can be way on the other side of the filtration plant. But again, there's been no link up either with planning on the other side of the river uh, in order to make sure that both ends are going to meet in the same place. In 1974, a regional council considered a motion to drop the Britannia arterial from the regional plan. That vote ended in a tie. The tie was broken by regional chairman Dennis Kulikin, the only member of regional council not elected by the residents of the Ottawa Carlton area. He voted to keep the arterial. Yes, there are two reasons. One, the, uh, in the regional plan uh, is based on trans a transportation system where there will be mostly, most of the transportation will be done by public transport. The, uh, in setting this up, there are uh, a number of uh, art, uh, a, a number of corridors that have to keep be kept open if this is going to work, so that it's all part of a regional plan and doesn't the the reasons for the arterial being required are not just in that particular locality. The uh, second uh, is that if you set people on notice and if you set uh, it on notice that that land is eventually going to be required when it is needed, then it will be much less expensive to get. It's on the old railway right-of-way that is already going through the community and has gone through the community for some time. So that uh, the other thing is that, uh, as far as the Britannia arterial, that probably the time when we will need it will be set back a bit because of the excellent results that we've had with public transport in that part of the uh, regional municipality, much better than we expected. For the love of mine, for the good of man, don't put it in my neighborhood. And that arterial that you got planned is gonna split it like an axe splits wood. I know it does your heart good to see them cars moving, but don't you have a place left for all us mixed up humans? For the love of Mike, for the good of man, don't put it in my neighbor, put it in my neighbor, put it in my neighborhood. The Britannia arterial will have a detrimental effect on one community. The Vanier arterial, on the other hand, threatens to affect at least two communities and a fair number of businesses as well. The proposed route of the arterial follows a line east of the Rideau River from the Queensway through the community of Overbrook, through the city of Vanier, down into New Edinburgh, across the river behind City Hall, and ends up connecting with the Macdonald Cartier Bridge. The idea is to provide a road that would ease north-south traffic flow that presently filters through residential streets in Ottawa East. The arterial would also give commuters from Gloucester Township a quicker route to offices in Hull. Originally, the regional plan called for construction of a six-lane elevated expressway to be built on the site, but the National Capital Commission, the owners of the land, forced the plan to be modified into a four-lane parkway. Unlike other parkways, however, this one won't be wide enough to have green space on either side, or a grassy median, so the residents of the area have taken to calling it an arterial. One third of the roadway 
has already been constructed and was opened for use in 1975 at a cost of six million dollars. It runs from MacArthur Road to Beechwood Avenue. Incidentally, the completed section hasn't been standing up well and recently Regional Council had to allocate one thousand dollars for engineering studies to try and solve the problem of asphalt heaving. Yet to be built is the section of the arterial that runs through New Edinburgh, threatening to ruin the park behind City Hall. While community concern in New Edinburgh revolves around preventing this from happening, the threat in Overbrook is much more immediate. The section of the Vanier arterial that will cut through Overbrook has residents of that area up in arms. To find out why, we talked to Louise Gagné of the Overbrook Community Council. What exactly is the arterial going through Vanya going to do to the community of Overbrook? Well, I think the arterial is going to affect Overbrook because it is going to bisect Overbrook and it will affect very highly the quality of living of the Overbrook community. And uh, perhaps I could explain that very briefly. Bisecting it is, uh, it is not designed yet to deserve our community. It is designed to serve out the traffic coming let's say mainly from Montreal or far eastern points the Overbrook community towards the hall mainly and also will have some access toward the center town if you know the area at all you'll realize that we will have only one or two one entrance which is Donald Street and this is perhaps one of the reasons why we are violently opposing to it because it will create a devaluation of our property but that could be secondary I would place first the factor that along this um, specific point you do have five to seven school Overbrook also carries a very uh, the highest percentage of senior citizens uh, the RTL is a project of four to six lane that's not definite yet and there is no pedestrian crosswalk uh, design. I feel it is impossible for those people, children and elderly people, to cross on a safe way those main artery. I perhaps could with a bit of run. You know, running, uh, at the, if you look at the um, intersection, there is uh, the four lane comes into six plus communica communication uh, to the uh, other strip of uh, going, how would you say, um, opposite direction. Right. That makes uh, six to eight lanes to cross. There's no way you can do that even in the, in the timing of a red light. And still, when you're coming to the, uh, the communication intersection, there's no light there. Traffic comes in even if it's red over here. You have to run those two strips. Well, if I can, the senior citizen cannot. And if I would have shopping bags, which is what you do but behind here, there is a small store at all points. I'm going for my bread and milk. I can't run with that in my arms. Now, if I have to take my car and go around 10, 12th Street because I want bread and milk, it's not very practical. And I, I'm forgetting a very, very important point, which I would say is a public, public transport. It's not efficient right now. How can it be efficient if all those streets, most of the streets of the uh, lower section, become non-exit? Can you see a bus going in a small street, trying to turn off or back out? I can't. So how are we going to have a public transport? We're fully cut off. We're opposing because, first of all, it is destroying our living quality standard in here. It's devaluing our property, and it's not serving us. By no means. I have failed to see or find a point, even though I've tried one point who would help us in it. That's perhaps the main, main point of all. How about schools in the area? Does it affect schools at all? Well, enormously, because you have the school are almost all the schools are located along the arterial besides two which are a little farther in now those children come from each side of the, uh, the strip of land which is going to be the arterial you can't have those children cross safely as i said earlier such a large intersection means that they will be probably re-road somewhere i don't even know how they have faced that problem yet but i know that if i would have children and live on the other side i would be uh, frenetic about them crossing an arterial of that and vergure every, uh, well, I would say four times per day, morning, lunchtime, back, and come back at home. There's no way I would uh, take that in consideration. So what are we supposed to do? There is, most of the school are on each side, and two of them are immediately on the arterial. What do you think your chances are of stopping the arterial? 
Well, I think what is not built certainly can be stopped. What I would like to see for the result of the, 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 the stopping of the arterial is perhaps succeeding to convince our politician, those gentlemen or ladies named to represent ourselves, our best interest, to foresee the uh, defects of the project as it is right now. It seems that right now they do consider the citizen from other part, but not overbroke. That's an enormous failure. I would like them to be able to be far more human to the uh, problem in our specific area where it's actually passing. For the love of mine, for the good of man, don't put it in my neighborhood. And that arterial that you got planned is gonna split it like an axe splits wood. I know it does your heart good to see them cars moving, but don't you have a place there for all us mixed up humans? For the love of Mike, for the good of man, don't put it in my neighbor, put it in my neighbor, put it in my neighborhood. We've been looking at just a few of the more controversial aspects of the regional plan tonight, and we've been dealing with specifics. But many of the plan's critics attack it at a much more basic level. For example, the city of Ottawa revolves all of their objections around the projected population of one million people for the region by 1998. The city feels that a population of this kind is not necessary and is even less desirable. And they say as much in this document, which is the city of Ottawa's official objections to the regional plan that were submitted to the provincial minister of housing, Mr. John Rhodes. The regional plan will have an effect on the business community in Ottawa Carleton as well. And to find out what that effect might be, we spoke to Mr. Leonard Pateshin of the Municipal Affairs Committee of the Ottawa Board of Trade. Mr. Pateshin, your particular area of expertise is real estate. And I was wondering if, based on that, you could give us some comment on the housing projections that have been incorporated into the regional plan. The regional plan calls for a 55% of any new developments being ground-oriented with half of that amount in singles or semi-detached housing. Uh, we feel that this is too restrictive. There are many new innovations in housing. The mayor's example of sending planners to Tapiola and coming back to the city of Ottawa and trying to incorporate this in the eastern community is one of them. Uh, we think that by restricting ground-oriented housing to over uh, to 55 percent we are depriving many people from owning their own home mm -hmm. okay um, connected with this then is the uh, idea that there will be a population in the region of, uh, of a million people by the year 1998 now this ties in with the idea of having the appropriate number of homes available for all these people but first of all does the Board of Trade agree with that figure of one million people by that uh, by that time the Board of Trade really can agree or disagree with that figure because the figure is based on the federal government not doing anything with many of the departments that they're deciding to transfer. Those studies were made before we knew that a number of our uh, departments were being transferred out of the city of Ottawa. Uh, uh, I don't see how we can possibly agree or disagree with that figure without knowledge of what the federal government is going to do. Okay, inherent in the regional plan as well then, and this, this follows along with, with what the federal government has been doing in, in the recent past, is the idea of decentralizing employment what with the creation of certain uh, satellite cities outside of the Greenbelt. And I was wondering if the Board of Trade saw any effect that that might have on, on the region. The Board of Trade is very, very concerned with what the federal government is doing to the center core of our city. They are creating a ghost town out of the center of the city. They have transferred departments right out of Ottawa. Uh, some of the buildings that have had government employees in it for the last 10 years uh, are being vacated. Uh, if we don't get new industry or government departments coming back into the city of Ottawa, the center of our city is going to become vacant and it's going to become like some of the American cities where they've had problems down in the center core, and we're very concerned with the situation. Okay, dealing then in specifics, uh, on a, in a business sense, um, part of the regional plan designates certain areas for regional shopping plazas and regional shopping centers, and I was wondering if the Board of Trade had any comment to make on the locations of those centers. Well, 
there's a controversy between Gloucester Township and the city of Ottawa. Gloucester certainly needs additional assessment, otherwise it's going to become a, a bedroom community for the city of Ottawa. Uh, the city of Ottawa would like additional commercial assessment. Now, all developers, before they go into the construction of a shopping center, do surveys. They do traffic counts, they do market studies. They decide if a shopping center can be supported. All the major stores would do the same thing. All the department stores that'll make a, a regional shopping center viable do the same thing. Now, if they believe that a center is viable, I don't see why the Board of Trade should uh, uh, say that they shouldn't go in there. The Board of Trade is encouraging more industry and more commercialism in the city, not less. Mm -hmm. In a general nature, then, what about the regional plan as a whole? Does the Board of Trade see it as a good plan, or do they see it as a bad plan? Is it worth supporting, or is it not? The plan as a whole was a necessary item. We think that the plan is good. However, there are a couple of items that we think should be done. At the present time, the businessman doesn't know who he has to go to to get a plan approved. There is no clear distinction of authority between the various departments in regional government. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you give us an example of how that might trip somebody up in the business community? Well, they, uh, for example, they can turn around and the zoning is fine, but then regional roads may object to it. Mm -hmm. so they don't know which department to, uh, to approach. Do they approach the planning department of the city of Ottawa? Do they approach just the building, de uh, building inspection of the city of Ottawa if they want to build in Ottawa? Or do they have to go to a building appearance committee uh, in three different localities? Do they have to go to the planning branches of both Ottawa and regional government? There are many distinct variations of where and how a plan can fall apart. Did you see uh, this kind of bureaucratic um, delay system working in the actual implementation of the plan or the development of the regional plan itself, something that was generated by regional government? Do you think that had to go through the same kind of system? Uh, I saw a specific case uh, on Bank Street where regional road department requested that a developer relocate his business. In order to do so, he had to get a 50 by 100 foot lot uh, rezoned. When he applied for the rezoning, Regional Roads objected to it, saying that they uh, would only approve providing he didn't have entrance and exit onto Bank Street and he had 210 feet of frontage. The plan never went ahead. The city lost a fair amount of assessment that they could have used from a commercial development. Joining the business community and objecting to the regional plan are various citizens groups in the area. Now, many of these groups have serious doubts about the plan, but specifically they question who the planners are planning for, since sometimes it seems that they aren't planning for the present residents of the region. Elspeth Menendez is the president of the Federation of Citizens Associations of Ottawa Carleton. Now, the Federation has come under fire by several regional politicians about their objections to the regional plan. To find out exactly what the Federation's objections were, we spoke to Mrs. Menendez. What role did the Federation play in the development of the regional plan, if any role? Well, when the regional government came on deck uh, in 1970 and was given the job of official plan, the Federation was the only coordinating uh, overall citizens organization in the region. And they helped to develop the public participation uh, process, and they co-hosted some of the public meetings. And so that's the role they played. They also took the responsibility upon themselves to try to animate uh, public participation among their uh, members and among citizens in the region. Is the Federation uh, happy with the way the public participation process has gone with the regards to the regional plan? Well, there are many parts about, about it that we were very unhappy about, but basically uh, there was a lot of involvement of citizens in it. That part we're pleased with. Uh, there were an, a large number of briefs put in. There were a large number of public meetings and workshops at which citizens took a very active role. Where it broke down was when the uh, politicians 
uh, they didn't become involved early enough. There was a lot of involvement between the um, planning committee, um, the uh, technical people, the planners at region, and citizens. But the decisions were made by the politicians without participating in the whole process. And that was probably why the uh, plan, draft plan, was changed a great deal uh, to produce the final plan. How long has it been since there's been some kind of direct public involvement in the development of the plan? Uh, October 9th, 1974. So practically two years then. Except for this last little effort uh, that was made when the modifications came down by the minister. And because we requested it, they, they put out a publication um, that could be given to people on request as to what the minister had said about the plan at this date. Now what about the projected population uh, growth factor that's in the regional plan of one million people by the year 1998? Does the Federation have any opinion on that? Well, not only does the Federation have any opinion on that, that was perhaps the most common complaint at all the public meetings. Uh, people came and stood up frequently and said, I, you know, I love the area. I want it to stay the way it is. You know, do we have to have a million people? And a lot of us felt that no, that there perhaps could be ways that they could achieve a lower level of population. And uh, one of these ways was decentralizing of the major employer, um, of the employees of the major employer, which is the federal government. Decentralizing it outside the region in other parts of, um, of eastern Ontario even, such as Cornwall or Pembroke. And or decentralizing them through the rest of Canada. This was something that, um, since it wasn't in the jurisdiction of the region, the region wasn't able to respond to very adequately. But since then, we know now that the, there is a great uh, impetus in the federal government to decentralize, and also that there is um, a general trend to cut down on the growth of the civil service. Does the Federation think that a regional plan is really necessary for Ottawa Carleton? Well, yes, I do think they do, because the Federation ag agrees with regionalism. Um, they do think that problems have to be looked at on a regional base, and therefore problems of transportation must not only uh, be looked at as urban problems, but as suburban and rural problems as well. And so therefore you do need to have an overall study and plan for this. And I think it's a very responsible attitude uh, of citizens to look at more than their, just their uh, yard and their street and their neighborhood. And that's what we're trying to achieve, and you can only do that by having um, a region-wide outlook. Also, I think it, uh, it gets rid of um, so many of the worst problems of development and speculation. There is a great uh, need to maintain agricultural land, and that's only done through, through land use policies. And also you have to maintain your recreational uh, areas and maintain the natural environment. You can only do this, uh, I think, through a, uh, through a plan. So I think that uh, I think most people who have looked at the future of their area will agree that there has to be a regional plan. So there we have two different outlooks on the regional plan from two divergent groups, the business community and citizens associations. But since all this criticism on the regional plan has been directed towards regional politicians and bureaucrats, perhaps it's only fair to give them the last word. And who better to ask than regional chairman Dennis Cooligan? Do you feel that the regional plan overall is a good plan? And if so, how do you account for the number of objections that have been filed with the Minister of Housing in the province about the plan? Well, the regional plan is indeed a very good plan. It's a uh, it's the only plan that's been produced for the region. It's one that's taken some four years. It's been done by people who are experienced in this kind of work, and they aren't, there aren't many. Uh, it has also been done with a great deal of public input, both before the plan was developed and after the plan was developed. In fact, all of the groups that might be interested in it were given all of the material that, as it came to the planning committee before the planning committee or the planners had made up their minds on any of it. And in some of it, they were consulted even before there was any question of gathering material going on. In fact, we had a, a, a program that went on, I think it was four or five summers ago, even uh, just asking for what people's ideas were. The, uh, uh, why there has been uh, as much uh, appeal and uh, objection to it, of course, is quite natural because almost invariably this kind of appeal represents a local interest. And there is nothing that is in the plan that hasn't been the result of a great deal of discussion and 
in some cases, but it's the same thing that everybody's in favor of a good arterial roadway, provided it doesn't go near where you live. Uh, you're, you're all in favor of having arterial roads, but it mustn't be along our particular street, and this is uh, quite natural, and the fact of it is that it would be it would be hard to say that it was good for the region as a whole unless people who were looking at it narrowly did object. Do you think that this is a healthy um, dialogue between the, the community and, and It's not only government? highly healthy, it's, uh, it's to be expected. The regional plan hasn't been completed in its final form yet, and it's just recently reached the end of a rather complex process and procedure of being passed back and forth from regional council here in Ottawa to the Provincial Ministry of Housing in Toronto for modifications and changes. As of the end of this past July, Provincial Housing Minister John Rhodes has approved parts of the plan and has referred other parts on to the Ontario Municipal Board for final arbitration. Those parts which have been passed on to the OMB have been based on objections that have been lodged with him from residents in the region of ottawa Carleton. Those OMB hearings, incidentally, will probably take place sometime in late November or early December of this year. And even decisions coming out of the OMB hearings don't necessarily have to be final. They can be referred to the Ontario Provincial Cabinet for appeal. We've tried tonight to take a look at at least some of the aspects of the regional plan. We didn't have time to look at them all, of course. We didn't take a look, for instance, at the rapid transit proposals in the plan. We didn't take uh, any look at daycare facilities that will be made available. We didn't look at water and sewage treatment. There are many, many other things in the regional plan that we couldn't look at because of the time restriction of the program. We hope, however, that we have provided something that's been of interest to your community and perhaps provided an incentive to take a look at the regional plan to see what it has in store for your particular neighborhood. You may be surprised at what you find. Politicians have been extolling the virtues of public participation for a long time now, but it's only the citizens who can make sure that public participation becomes more than just another empty-sounding platitude. I'm Ken Rockburn. Thanks for watching.